Good morning and welcome to the Coinbase Institutional Market School. It's Tuesday, the 25th of July. Summer is really running away from us, um, but there's a ton going on as usual. So we're going to run through all of that today. And we also have a special guest, Ryan, from our Ventures team, who's going to run through everything that's going on in the Ventures ecosystem uh, and give us a bit of insight into Coinbase Ventures. But to our agenda... We are going to kick off with Ryan, as mentioned. We're then going to go through what George has been looking at this week. So Worldcoin launching, he's going to run through Derivs and Vol, and then also a little bit around the XRP news. We're then going to hand it across to David to go through what he saw at ETC. Um, great to have him back in the country. Uh, and there was a ton of excitement there. Certainly been great listening to him so far about what he saw there. So looking forward to that. We're then going to run through some more flow-related items with Greg. He's also going to comment on the options space. And then lastly, we'll finish off with Tammy, who's going to run through blockchains and AI and ML and some of the potential applications. She was also at ECC for part of the week last week. So he's going to give us a bit of a rundown. By all accounts, the energy there was incredible and it was a fantastic week. So very jealous I didn't manage to make it. But uh, happy that these folks are here and can kind of run us through what went on. If you are watching on YouTube, don't forget to scan the QR code to check out David and the team's fantastic research. If you're listening on podcast, the links will be in your show notes. And don't forget to check those out. Um, also, don't forget to hit subscribe and you'll get an alert every single week when a new recording comes online. So you can keep up to date with all the latest and greatest within the crypto ecosystem. But without further ado, um, Ryan, I want to introduce you and bring you into the call. Um, you are a crypto OG. You've been at a buy side firm before Coinbase. You've been at Coinbase a long time. Uh, you've got a really interesting perspective of what uh, goes on in crypto and how the space has evolved. Um, so welcome to the show firstly. And perhaps you could start with a quick overview of maybe your background and what you do at Coinbase today. Sure. Thanks, Ben. Hey, everybody. My name is Ryan. Uh, I sit on the Coinbase Ventures team. Um, been in the crypto investing space since 2017, uh, spent the first three years at a crypto hedge fund called coin fund doing both sort of public and private investing in crypto, uh, and then moved over to Coinbase, uh, ventures in 2020, uh, to help build out our ventures portfolio, uh, as well as provide a lot of strategic outlooks on the different types of, uh, projects and new initiatives that Coinbase might want to tackle. Amazing. So let, let's start from the top. Coinbase Ventures is probably an area of the business that maybe not that many people know that much about. Can you give us a, a kind of a quick overview? Yeah, sure. Just uh, super quickly. So Coinbase Ventures started in 2018. Uh, we invest strictly off the balance sheet. We don't have any external investors. And the goal was basically to invest into early stage projects in crypto and Web3. Uh, the mandate is pretty simple, you know, back exceptional founders working on big, big ideas and to basically advance the entire crypto ecosystem. Uh, the goal is to both help seed the ecosystem with new innovations, but as well as to drive long term value for Coinbase. So today we have over 400 plus portfolio companies across many different categories, across many different geographies. Uh, go to our website, ventures.coinbase.com, uh, if you want to check out uh, anything specific to that. Um, and yeah, happy to kind of talk more broadly about the overall venture market as well as some of the trends that we're seeing. Thanks, Ryan. So it's super interesting. Um, you guys have made a ton of investments. I know you're a very, very small team, so very impressive that you can you can do all of that at the same time. Now, the crypto ecosystem in the public markets, at least, has had a pretty big drawback um, in the last sort of 18, 18 months or so. I'm curious, what does that look like on the venture side of things? Sure. Thanks, Ben. Um, yeah, I think the sort of overarching theme is, you know, the private market has really come down to reflect the public uh, crypto market cap as well. And so valuations are are down as well as uh, the amount um, to amount that are being raised by startups are also down as well. Uh, I do think FTX fallout in particular was was particularly difficult for a lot of startups, uh, both because, you know, maybe they were business related partners. Uh, but also many startups actually held their funds custodially on FTX. So, um, you know, obviously there's a lot of the bankruptcy proceedings happening right now. But I think from the startup's point of view, that's basically, you know, if they were projecting burn for X number of years, uh, a lot of that has been cut down uh, due to the FTX fallout. Uh, I think also in general, the bar is higher for venture investors to back companies. Uh, and I think they're beginning to ask questions like, 
hey, how does path to monetization look like in this market? Uh, how does product differentiation look like as well? Um, I, I would kind of like segment the two different types of companies that are going for raises right now is basically pre-Series A and post-Series A. I think the post-Series A companies uh, you know, raised a lot of money at, at the bull market, uh, and they're very much in the mode of, okay, let's just wait and survive and make sure we're not disrupted uh, and just grow uh, as the market will eventually come back. Uh, I think in the pre-Series A area, uh, it's very much a delineation between pre-product versus post-product and pre-traction versus post-traction. Uh, so I think in the same way, it, it used to kind of all be jumbled in, in the same mix, but uh, we're beginning to see sort of startups that command different valuations depending on where they are in that cycle. Uh, so in terms of the types of actions that startups end up taking with financing, um, I think in the worst case scenario, some are shutting down and returning investors' capital. Uh, some are choosing for an aqua hire path to bigger companies, both in Web2 and Web3. Uh, and then some of them are basically raising bridge rounds that are either flat to their last valuation or may even be at a discount to their previous valuation. Interesting. And is there any kind of truth to what kind of I hear occasionally about, about there being a ton of dry powder with the various kind of venture funds out there um, that could be invested, but people are kind of waiting for those valuations, A, to drift back, or B, to your point, the bar is that much higher, um, that they're kind of just waiting for the right opportunities as opposed to perhaps being uh, maybe slightly uh, easier to raise money in 2021. Yeah, I would definitely say there's some degree of truth to that. I think the way that I would categorize it is um, a lot of the bigger funds are choosing to invest earlier now. Um, and so I think even if you have like nine figures in AUM, uh, you're still very much looking at sort of the pre-seed, seed, uh, pre-series A area. Uh, and that's only a certain amount of money that can actually be raised in those rounds. Uh, so if you kind of do the math to the AUM, um, they do basically have to end up investing in a lot more companies and it'll just take a lot of time. Interesting. And what what are some of the, the themes that, that are kind of really common, like in the middle of 2023 where we are today? Sure. Yeah. Happy to talk about a couple of themes here. Um, so the first is what we're calling sort of the builder ecosystem, uh, basically which platforms are developers uh, building their dApps on and projects on. Uh, so just two things really quickly. Uh, one is sort of the EVM app chain thesis. Uh, so app chains are not new to crypto. Uh, you know, Cosmos uh, has really kind of come out as the original project that could really put that technology forward. Uh, but what's been interesting is that app chains are now coming to the Ethereum ecosystem uh, and, and very fast and very quickly. Uh, and so Optimism's OP stack basically makes it very easy for a one-click deployment of an EVM-compatible app chain. Um, and effectively, the projects that launch those app chains can actually monetize by uh, kind of block building through their sequencers. So just a couple of examples, obviously, Coinbase uh, has announced that they will be launching their own L2 base, which is built on OP stack. Uh, Zara Network, uh, which is a, a portfolio company of ours, which is an NFT project, is also building on uh, OP stack. Um, and actually, WorldCoin uh, is also built on OP stack as well. So there seems to be a lot of uh, builder energy in this area and specific theme. Uh, related to that, I think the sort of second order effect is kind of asking the question, well, if every chain is fast, uh, what is the actual differentiator over time? Uh, and it actually seems to be more so at the developer layer. So um, the more people that are building within a certain ecosystem, they can actually benefit from the existing tools and infrastructure that are already there. So case in point is, you know, if you're Arbitrum or any of these new EVM chains that are launching, uh, instead of needing to build a block, block explorer from scratch, you can actually go to Etherscan, which has already built a lot of that EVM tooling, uh, and they can actually easily support those new chains as well. So this goes for indexers, this goes for block explorers, this goes for wallets, uh, and anything else that has been built around that ecosystem. Uh, so that's been quite interesting to see. Interesting. And what about user experience? I feel like in crypto, we are we we have, we we're kind of building some amazing technology, but we're kind of like bridging that gap between like Web two, Web three uh, is something that people are maybe focusing on a little more at this part of the of the the market's maturity. Um, are you guys seeing much there that, that excites you? Yeah, uh, 100%. Um, I think UX to this point has gotten easier for crypto native people and people that may have like a lower bar uh, for how they want to interact with crypto applications. But I think to be quite honest, like if 
we had any of our family members that are not in crypto want to use it, uh, it's still quite difficult. But what's been great to see is a couple of vectors that are beginning to form. Uh, so one is enterprise wallets. And it's the idea that the application itself uh, actually hosts a wallet for a user. So when you sign into a decentralized application, you don't actually need to have a wallet already. They will actually mint one for you. Um, and the types of services that are going out there, uh, you know, Coinbase has our, our own product, uh, which, which we've announced, and uh, a lot of other projects in this space also uh, helping startups uh, really be able to create those wallets. Uh, the second is a constant account abstraction. I'm sure this has like gone you know, on, on Twitter and, and you know, a lot of people have been uh, using this word. I, I think at the end of the day, what it really means is applications uh, will basically have a lot more control around defining the type of actions and UX that can be passed to the wallet or the, or the user. Um, so instead of clicking five different things, basically what an application can do is they can actually abstract those five interactions into one thing. Um, and that makes sense because the application itself probably understands the code, uh, both on the front end and the smart contract the best. So I just want to yeah. jump in there because you're right. It's definitely a buzz phrase that I'm sure folks are hearing quite a lot of. And I know Vitalik was talking about it last week at ETC. Can you provide like a good example of where account abstraction materially changes the UX uh, for, for the end user? Yeah, so I think um, you know if you use a DAP right now, uh, there's if, if you want to let's say put in you, you want to LP capital into a DeFi pool. Um, I, I'll just use an example. It'll probably take like between five to seven transactions, uh, and some of those are off-chain transactions, some of those are on-chain transactions. Um, now, the reason why it's that way is because the wallet itself doesn't know, like, can only will only use the UX in the way that it's been designed by the application. Uh, and, the, uh, and honestly, the wallet doesn't have the time or the resources to actually create that custom experience. And so what's account abstraction is basically a way for to describe the application, actually defining, hey, like they want to LP into a DeFi pool. OK, we know that these are the five to seven like common interactions that is actually happening in the back end. Why don't we just collapse that? Um, and actually have the wallet understand it. And when you sign one transaction, it signs all five. Uh, so that's a very high level example, but hopefully that, that helps kind of uh, clear, clear at least my, my conception of how I understand account abstraction. I mean, if anything that takes five transactions down to one, I, I think is, uh, <laughs> is probably, probably a good thing. As much as, I, as, as much as I love trying out new wallets and new chains and things like that, the concept of having to send uh, the native tokens, you can actually make new transactions is, is always uh, a bit of a an unnecessary hurdle, it feels like. So I think if that can be improved, then that makes a ton of sense. Yeah. Um, and then instant bridging, you've got this on your slide as well. How, how do you how do you think about that? Sure. Um, yeah, I think bridging, uh, you know, as a, people understand it as sending tokens and digital assets across different blockchains. Um, and I think with the growth of L2s, uh, as we mentioned previously, um, that the, the need for bridging is just going to need to get better and better. Um, but what's been interesting is I think bridging will go just beyond just sending and receiving digital assets um, as, as a use case. Uh, I think over time, it'll actually turn into things like, hey, I'm a developer and I've deployed one of my smart contracts on one chain uh, and I actually want to deploy it on every other chain that also supports uh, that developer framework. Um, today, you would actually deploy that uh, on each chain individually. But in the future, what might actually happen is you deploy it once and then the bridging platform can actually take care of the rest. Uh, so in the same way that account abstraction kind of collapses uh, five transactions from one UX, uh, I kind of think of bridging as basically taking care of the back end and dealing with all the sort of messy blockchain logic to make it happen. Okay, cool. So, so we've got ecosystems that are going to be faster, cheaper. We've got UX, which is, is enabled because it's faster, cheaper, uh, and, and account connection which reduces these things to, to kind of a few transactions, uh, one transaction versus five or six. I guess, what are the new things that you can do as a result of those improvements? Yeah, I think it's more like, you know, if, if we have really good blockchain scalability and speed, and we have generally just better UX uh, to the point where you know anybody in the world can use a decentralized application. Then I think there's really no excuse for crypto not to be ready for the mainstream, right? 
I think the argument has always been that technology is holding us back. But in this new cycle, if the technology doesn't hold us back, it's just a matter of proving out the crypto utility and crypto use cases. I think there is a responsibility by the industry uh, to really create those. And hopefully we can, you know, at that point, actually bring a lot of builders that were maybe scared away of a lot of the complexity and technology of crypto. Uh, and when they come in, everything almost just feels like as you would build or deploy in Web2 or other technology services that we're familiar with. Yeah, that, that that makes a ton of sense. Definitely on the vanguard right now with the, with the folks that are willing to take a bit of friction in the in the processes to to get stuff up and running. I'm curious, like, what are like, are there any particular bits of utility that you would highlight now as as being interesting? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, so th these are just sort of on the horizon, um, but we're we're beginning to see uh, some some interesting green shoots. So I think one is just the concept of the one dollar NFT. So when people think about NFTs, they think of you know these scarce profile pictures that you know garner you know almost like hundred thousand dollar plus value uh, in each of them. But rather than scarcity based NFTs, I think what you're beginning to see is even things like time oriented. So hey, you can only mint this NFT during this week, uh, and they'll be capped at one dollar per NFT. And it kind of takes this concept of an NFT to turn into more of like a collectible or a badge. Uh, and then you can actually access it uh, and uh, for four different types of interactions that are defined by the the project itself. So it might be, hey, buy this NFT, and then you know you can actually join this music platform, which gives you early access to new music or new concerts or things like that. Sort of related to it is what we're calling you know Web three passport, Web three community management. But it's essentially this idea that there's just a lot more off-chain data that is going to be that is beginning to actually be attached to your wallet. Um, so today, if you go to a company like Guild.xyz, you can actually connect your existing socials, so your Twitter, your Discord, or your GitHub, to your wallet address, uh, and it's all done in an off-chain way and privacy preserving. Uh, and what that ends up happening is communities, especially Web3 projects that want to get de better data fidelity and targeting to their users can actually see like, oh, okay, like this set of wallet addresses are using our application. We can see they've connected their Twitter. Uh, we can see they, they've connected their GitHub or their Discord. And they can actually see like, hey, this wallet address has this much contributions and PR according to the GitHub profile. Or, hey, um, we actually want to reach out to these wallet users through Discord, and they can actually do that now. So I, I think it's kind of building into this vision of like wallets are understood as the way to interact on chain, but it'll actually kind of graduate into something that'll almost become like a single sign on into the internet. So in the same way that you have sign in with Facebook or sign in with Google, I think in the future you'll have sign in with Ethereum, and that it'll just be a much more seamless experience. Yeah, I, I kind of feel like the uh, like marketeers for forever have always wanted to be able to link like that transaction to the user, like actually, and it was always kind of going through the like the, the card provider, which made it slightly difficult, and you didn't know exactly what they bought or whatever. But I feel like this is the, the the kind of the tip of the iceberg where you could actually start to truly understand who your end consumer is and then target them in a way which is. I guess meaningful to them and, and not spam because I think like we're still not quite there yet, but this feels like it's getting slightly closer to that direction. Yeah, exactly. And I think it, it'll be powerful too with um, the sort of enterprise wallet theme that we discussed as well. Um, the idea that basically, like you know, if you can sign into an application as a net new crypto user, uh, minting your wallet is going to be super easy. And then you're able to bring your entire off online life to your wallet as well. Uh, so immediately sort of that those two steps combined together can actually be quite powerful and uh, really sort of enriching the Web3 economy as we know it. Very cool. Very cool. Um, well, Ryan, thank you so much for, for taking the time out of your busy day. Um, I'll let you get back to the 400 plus companies that you guys are having to uh, uh, help out on a daily basis. Um, and uh, yeah, that was great. It's good, really good to get an understanding of what's going on in the Ventures ecosystem. I'm sure we'll have you on again soon. No nice. worries. Always a pleasure. Thanks, Ben. See you. Thanks, Ryan. Um, right, George, over to you, sir. Looking at your first slide, make it up 20%, Doge up as well. Is retail back? What's What's been going on? Yeah, thanks, Ben. Uh, so last week, uh, we actually, looking at the big pictures, definitely started to see some more uh, weakness uh, in this space. I mean, the price section was very muted, to be fair, uh, in consolidation mode in, in the majors. Um, it's very similar, actually, to what we've seen uh, in the week before, after we had a long stretch of... Um, 
a couple of weeks of news uh, with pretty positive headlines uh, regarding the Bitcoin spot ETF and uh, the XRP ruling as well, which we um, talked about in length in uh, last week's call. Uh, so Bitcoin accordingly was down uh, about 3% uh, over the last seven days. Um, ETH is down around 2.7% uh, with ALS on average uh, bleeding a little bit more. Uh, so DeFi Pulse Index down 87 But as you mentioned, obviously there are um, certain uh, bright spots as well uh, with some outperformance. Um, so taking the example of Maker, uh, that one was up 20% over the last seven days. Uh, mainly follows the introduction of a smart burn mechanism that should burn around 0.7% um, of the supply over the next uh, month or so. Uh, Doge also did pretty well, up 11%. Uh, so that comes on the back of Twitter rebranding with lots of speculation um, whether Doge will be used as some form of currency on the network. Um, but uh, obviously, this is not the first time that people have been speculating about that. We have seen spikes in the price like that or even larger uh, when that topic has come up before. So uh, I'd be a little cautious with that. Um, generally speaking, though, um, altcoins remain definitely in focus. And if you look at Bitcoin traded volume dominance uh, globally, that's down from 45% in January to 27% now. And the interesting thing is actually if you look at how that, that split up between the U.S. and uh, offshore, um, with hardly any change in uh, Bitcoin uh, volume dominance in the US, uh, but offshore, actually, um, on offshore exchanges, uh, Bitcoin volume dominance has gone from 46% in January to um, 26% now. Wow. So, George, that, that's a pretty huge change. Um, and it's also very marked based on kind of geography. Like, why, why do you think that is? Yeah, for sure. So um, it's 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 a very good question. And I think um, part of it is that historically there has been uh, a lot of uh, speculative flow in altcoins, in particular from East Asia, from countries uh, such as Korea, um, and you had at times, you know, some some of you guys will remember uh, during the past bull run, massive premium. So I think at one point, like during the 17, 18 run, uh, Bitcoin was trading at a 30, 40 percent uh, premium on some of the Korean exchanges. So I think uh, with the market heating up uh, a little bit, it's natural that this type of flow should pick up uh, a little bit quicker in, in that region. Um, the second thing is looking at it sort of from a macro lens, um, I would say that inflation has definitely been a lot higher in the US and uh, in Europe and has gone down uh, faster in East Asia. So um, I would argue um, that uh, disposable incomes have taken less of a hit there uh, and uh, are in a better spot um, than, than over here. And then um, one other thing that you know I, I think also ultimately uh, impacts that is uh, just very simply the larger availability um, and easier access to trade some of the very long tail coins um, that get listed very quickly on some of these offshore exchanges, whereas uh, US onshore exchanges like Coinbase obviously go through a very uh, rigorous um, uh, listing and uh, due diligence process. Cool. That makes a ton of sense. Talking of new launches, uh, especially in offshore exchanges, we had a Worldcoin launch yesterday. Uh, how, how did that go? Yeah, that was definitely uh, probably the, the biggest uh, one of the biggest headlines of the last uh, seven days or so. It's quite remarkable to see that actually the uh, fully diluted value of DB was uh, above thirty billion dollars at one point yesterday. Uh, the price has come back down uh, somewhat since then, um, but the idea is basically to have an orb that you can. Um, scan your iris with to prove that you are a human. And I think the technology um, itself seems uh, super exciting because it could help do such things as, for instance, uh, solve the uh, bot problem online that we have and um, you know make um, engagement on social media more authentic, as an example. Um, question though is uh, you know what will the coin itself for instance be used for outside of airdrops and trying to uh, increase adoption that's one thing that was criticized with it um, outside of the uh, tokenomics um, obviously um, and the project I mean let's face it may also have a, a perception problem because um, ultimately there can be a myriad of uh, data privacy issues um, plus how um, do we guarantee that all people will get this world ID? How easy um, is that going to be? That's one point that Vitalik actually made. And also, how can we guarantee that it's not going to be uh, misused by uh, malicious actors, perhaps even the ones that uh, will build these orbs? Um, so uh, all in all, I think it's, it's a super interesting project from a technological point of view. 
but there's still um, a lot of questions and uh, in particular on the tokenomics uh, side of things as well. Yeah, that, make, that makes a ton of sense. It's interesting seeing Vitalik's comments. As, as always, an incredibly well-reasoned, balanced uh, perspective from him. Um, have, you, have you scanned your iris yet, George? Uh, no, no, I, I haven't yet. I think I'll, I'll probably be a slightly, slightly later adopter on that one. But as you say, I definitely recommend um, the, the blog that uh, Vitalik has written about that. That's, it's, it's definitely a very good read if you're interested in the topic. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, what else has been uh, in front of you this week? Yeah, so there's a couple of other headlines. Obviously, I mentioned the, the Twitter rebrand uh, earlier, uh, which was interesting. Um, there are some headlines about a potential appeal uh, coming up in the uh, Ripple ruling uh, from the regulators. So that's definitely something to, to keep an eye on uh, as well. And then um, one headline uh, about Nasdaq actually uh, pulling back um, from the idea of, of launching a um, custody provider at this point in time, citing market conditions. Uh, which probably makes sense given um, you know uh, the volume volumes are down a little bit and um, we're generally in a quiet period in the market at the moment. Um, but yeah, let's let's see how how that works out over the next um, twelve months or so. Cool, thank you, George. Appreciate that. Um, over to you, David. Um, welcome back. Great to have you back in the country from ECC. Uh, it sounds like you had an amazing time. Maybe can we just start with a bit of a rundown? Like, how was it? Uh, what was the I guess the most exciting parts for you? Yeah. Uh, so ECC tends to be a bit different from the traditional kind of uh, conferences that I, I think are a little bit more market focused or maybe like issues like regulatory kind of comes up here. It's mainly about developers. Uh, and I think that the vibe was very, very positive. It was just kind of nice to see people building. Amazing. And I guess what were the big topics or themes that you were, were spending a lot of time uh, learning about and talking about? Uh, yeah, so I would say first, a humble brag for our Coinbase wallet team. Uh, so during ECC, uh, we actually hosted a cafe near the venue where Coinbase wallet users could actually receive some USDC and they could you know, buy a coffee or croissant. And you might be wondering why I'm telling you this. Uh, it actually involved gasless sends. Uh, that's basically a form of account abstraction that works without uh, ERC-4337. Um, and if none of that jargon kind of made sense to you, effectively, the idea is just that users didn't pay any gas. So they didn't use any ETH to spend their money with their Coinbase wallet. And it was all part of something called meta transactions. Uh, this was defined in EIP 3009 back in 2020. Uh, but it was just super cool to see. Um, but, you know, as, as per your question, I would say many of the discussions surrounded that idea. You know, Vitalik Buterin, you already mentioned he was there last week. His big topic was account abstraction. And we introduced this earlier this call, but we also talked about it last week. Uh, we didn't really go into the detail, but it's just, you know, this idea of turning externally owned accounts into smart contracts, I think is just super interesting. Uh, Justin Drake was there from the Ethereum Foundation. He spoke about MEV Burn. Uh, we've, we've had him on the calls before. Tim Bako, he spoke about the uh, types of users who actually make up the Ethereum community, the protocol upgrade process in general. And I think there was a lot of other topics that were just amazing, you know, discussions about decentralized sequencers on L2s, distributed validated technology, how that's going to fit into staking, um, a lot of coverage on zero knowledge proofs. Um, and of course, there were just a ton of announcements from a lot of projects that are rolling through. Amazing. So announcements, what were the, the big announcements that you, you took away? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, Base team had a big one. Uh, you know, just a reminder for our listeners, Base is a layer two on Ethereum that Coinbase launched. Uh, our team announced that Base mainnet is now open for builders ahead of general availability. Uh, that's going to be done in early August. Uh, so users will be able to access it at that point. Um, early builders have been invited to deploy on Base mainnet. Uh, but because people ask this all the time, uh, Base has no plans to issue a network token. Uh, there were other L2 announcements too, uh, a few actually. Uh, Formula Layer 1 Network, uh, Celo, uh, it's made by C-Labs, actually discussed its transition from an Ethereum L2 uh, using the, I'm sorry, from, from, an, from an L1 to an L2, leveraging the OpStack architecture. Um, and also its off-chain uh, data availability is going to be secured by Eigenlayer. So that, that's a big deal. Uh, we heard from Mantle, uh, which is backed by a merger with BitDAO. Uh, also an L2 has a modular design. It launched mainnet alpha last week. Um, and also it's got its data availability layer is going to be powered by EigenDA. Uh, Linnea, 
uh, has actually been developed by Consensus, which uh, for people who know, it also makes MetaMask. Uh, that is a ZK EVM that's going to be competing with you know Polygon ZK EVM, ZK Sync, Scroll, um, and it is able to achieve EVM equivalents at the bytecode level. Uniswap, uh, of course, major decentralized exchange that uh, I, I would think some of our listeners may use. Uh, it announced the Uniswap X protocol, which is going to be an aggregator across uh, automated market makers. Um, and also, it's going to permit gas-free swaps uh, and offer some protection against MEV extraction, which is very similar to uh, how CalSwap does it. Uh, Synthetics is a decentralized derivatives exchange and announced a new front end called Infinex. Chainlink, uh, there's a lot of these. Chainlink announced uh, cross-chain interoperability. Uh, it's a protocol that has been around for, that they've been talking about for a little while, but it's now open to developers. Uh, and finally, Polygon uh, went into further details on its Polygon 2.0 proposal, uh, where it's going to be migrating its Matic token to POL. Amazing. So we were at the cafe, we, you were spending USDC on base or what l1 like what was the talk me through that that whole exact kind of like nuts and bolts of that process so it's actually being done through polygon um and you know i think people kind of missed the the boat a little bit in terms of like what the significance of this was because you know it was paris and like every coffee croissant like we we priced it at one usdc and i think there was more buzz around like oh it's only one one usdc to buy a coffee like it's usually like five euro or something and i was like you're missing the point it's the technology that's what what makes this cool um and the idea behind it really comes down to it just basically abstracts that entire layer of way like no one and i think that's that's kind of the point no one was thinking about oh, I need to pay gas fees to kind of spend this transaction. It was just it was just seamless. And I think that's the key takeaway there. Yeah, 100%. Hey, Greg, Greg and I were sending each other dollars back and forth using the, the Coinbase wallet uh, messaging uh, platform the other day. It was it was amazing. It just felt uh, so smooth to, to do that. And it's one of the first times in a while that, that, we, that we felt that. So yeah, fully, fully agree. And very sad to miss out on French croissant. Um, clearly, the, <laughs> clearly the best in the world. Um, amazing. And David, obviously, there's a ton going on in macro this week. Can you give us a quick summary of what you're looking out for? Uh, yeah, I don't want to drag this on too long. So I, I would just say really quick on the macro side, it's a very busy week. Uh, a lot of central banks are going to make announcements across the board. Um, it's really not about what they're going to deliver so much as it's it's really about what they're going to signal. So for the Fed, for example, we expect a 25 basis point hike on Wednesday, ECB a 25 basis point hike on Thursday, Bank of Japan, very likely there's not going to be any change to the yield curve control policy on Friday. Uh, but I would say what we've seen is that the multilateral dollar index, the, DX, the DXY, uh, bottomed about a week ago, and it's been trending higher since. Uh, and, you know, that tends to make it a lot more difficult for cryptocurrencies because they're the foreign asset numerator and the pair. Uh, but part of that dollar move tends to be seasonal. But the other part is come, it's where the central banks come in because what they say this week could really affect interest rate differentials. And that then affects the US dollar. And that, of course, affects us in the cryptocurrency space. Um, it looks more like this could be the last fight for the Fed, even though they single signal that in their dot plot, it could be around two more. But the ECB, on the other hand, keeps getting all these weaker economic indicators uh, this week, it was just bad PMI numbers. Um, and I think that they do want to hike again in September, but it's a lot harder when the economic data doesn't support that decision. Meanwhile, the Bank of Japan, you know, they're probably going to change their inflation forecast and the quarterly economic report that they're going to publish this week. Uh, but they've been reluctant to give up on yield curve control, and they don't really want to pivot to a more hawkish stance. Uh, Ueda has been very adamant about maintaining the communication he has. So I don't think there's going to be any big surprises there. But the bottom line is, and I said it last week, I think market players really need to be playing this macro environment in a defensive way in the very short term. Um, I don't think it's a reason to be short, but I just think it's a it's a time to be patient. Okay. Thank you very much, David. Um, covered a ton, a t- oh, sorry, covered a ton there in a very short period of time. So thank you very much, as always, and great to have you back. Greg, so moving on to you, what has been happening on the desk this week? Yeah, thanks, Ben. Uh, Volumes have been pretty steady over the past week. Uh, We've seen global open interest for Bitcoin uh, fell about 10% over the last seven days. Uh, Open interest uh, across a broad range of other tokens also declined. Um, Really the exception only being Doge and XLM uh, and a few others that have more idiosyncratic stories going on at the moment. And then if we look at, you know, term futures, which we often do, 
Uh, front month basis in BTC is, is now at zero. Um, again, that's down from the highs of uh, as much as 20% annualized that we saw uh, two weeks ago. And further out the curve, uh, basis is around 8%, which is you know, in line with uh, per funding rates that we're seeing. You know, taking all of this, um, really it means to me that uh, the air is just continuing to come out of the tire here and people are uh, moving into a more wait and see mode. And that really coincides with you know, what we've been seeing on the desk. Uh, folks are active, but it's at a much slower pace. Um, our flows have been pretty balanced, uh, but both sides, uh, buyers and sellers, are being a bit more price sensitive. Um, you know, that uh, aggressive, just get me done um, sense that we had uh, not long ago is, is gone. People are moving to more passive order types and kind of just, uh, again, waiting to see what the market gives them in terms of opportunities. Interesting. Um, and, and, and what about the, uh, and you may touch this later, so, so please hold if you do, but I guess what is the end of the vol space are you seeing? Yeah, yeah, I'm glad you asked. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, actually, um, on the options front, you know, it's I feel like a broken record here. Uh, same story we've had for most of the year, uh, which is to say, if you thought implied volatility was cheap last week, wait until you see it this week. Um, the entire curve for both Bitcoin and ETH continues to soften uh, with the biggest moves in the front end. Um, but it is worth pointing out that you know, even as implieds continue to come in, the volatility risk premium, which is the implied vis-a-vis -vis the uh, realized, is still rather wide. Um, on the front end, it's around 17 vol points for ETH and uh, around 14 for BTC. So those of uh, us that you know used to trade FX vol, these are like miles wide um, and, and uh, you know very enticing. So um, still some opportunities out there for those that uh, like to harvest the volatility risk premium. Interesting. So, so given that setup, how would you position going forward from here? I mean, yeah, uh, a lot of different things you could do from the vol side. You could either just arb that outright, um, you know, or if you had a long bias, uh, you could look to underwrite your positions um, with short puts. If you have a uh, rather a shorter bias, uh, you may overwrite a position. Um, and, you know, on the spot side, uh, I think it's smart to stay invested, but remain, you know, somewhat cautious, uh, as David said, there are a lot of macro headwinds that we're dealing with, um, even though, you know, risk markets more generally haven't, uh, recognized them quite yet. Um, so what does this all mean? Uh, you know, I think it makes sense to own what you like here, but don't have a full position on. Um, because the issue with being out of the market completely is that you can very easily miss the best days. Um, and if we look back at, you know, the performance through 2023 so far, uh, the majority of crypto's gains have come from just a handful of days, less than 10. Um, so I think it's important to not, uh, you know, be out uh, completely kind of waiting for the, the next level lower. Um, because we do have some events on the horizon. Uh, we're going to hear from Grayscale or uh, the Grayscale uh, court case, that is, uh, which could be a catalyst. Um, and we have these ETF filings, uh, which we'll learn more about as they progress. Thank you, Greg. As always, a, a very well-rounded overview of flows, both in vol basis and, and spot. So uh, thank you very much. Tammy, over to you. I know you were at ETC uh, for the back end of the week. Um, what was it that excited you? And was maybe some of the similar things to David or, or other things uh, were kind of piquing your interest? Uh, I believe David has covered most of the exciting uh, announcement. And I was there because part of my work has been presented in the Oracle Summit last week. It's a research over the potential use of uh, on-chain data to proxy crypto value in real time so it can be served as an additional chat to off-chain price fit. And then the other hot topic is the ZKML, which is actually I'm going to cover in uh, the quick presentation later today. Perfect. So ZK and ML slash AI, you've got some buzzwords in there. Um, looking forward to, uh, to, to, to seeing what it is. 
Um, so today I will only give um, a very high level overview of some of the potential application for use uh, or use case for integrating blockchain with artificial intelligence. Um, AL algorithms are used to process vast amounts of data in order to identify patterns or make predictions. For the last of couple of years, the crypto community has definitely seen the benefit of integrating AI with blockchain. And these slides are the uh, some very common application in the space. For data analytic purpose, we can train machine learning model with on-chain data to detect illicit accounts on-chain or to guess whether address with similar transaction pattern belong to the same entity. Developers can also improve their productivity by outsourcing some of the development tasks to advanced AI tools like ChatGPT. So not saying that ChatGPT can replace the developer, but it can be used to make their life easily. Um, and then you can also train model of chain and then it can be used to um, on chain for different purpose. For example, there are protocols that train risk scoring model based on data available on the blockchain network. Model parameters will be deployed via smart contract and users are able to get the latest risk score based on the real time transaction data on chain. So these are the well known applications. And recently, the hottest topic for blockchain and AI is uh, using zero knowledge proof technology with AI models. Um, quick recap of what zero knowledge proof is. It is a crypto te cryptography technique that enable party A, like the prover, to prove to party B, verify that a statement is true without revealing any other information beyond that. So one key application to use zero knowledge proof technology is to prove that the machine learning model is run correctly, and some people refer that as the ZKML. Then why do we need? Uh, sorry, you have a question. Yeah, I know, I know. I was, I was just, I was just curious. Like, how many projects do we have working on uh, zero knowledge and, and AI combining it? Is it something which is still very new, or post very the excitement new. of AI in the last sort of six months, six to nine months or so, have we got a ton of projects working on it? Um is very new in the space. Most of them are still in the uh, research uh, stage. And then there's a protocol called Axim, was just launched as mainnet in alpha mode not long ago. So it enabled developer to create ZK proof for their off-chain models. So I think that the protocol is still at its early stage and may only be feasible for simple models rather than complex machine learning models. Interesting. And I guess just, just touching on your slides here, you say to differentiate human co controlled accounts from bot controlled accounts, it, it feels like there's some common themes here around uh, account abstraction and, and world coin and zero knowledge and, and AI. It feels like they, they all kind of converge in, in some ways. The main theme of this technology is to prove what's on chain, what, sorry, what's off chain is indeed been deployed correctly on chain. So if you look at the, um, uh, the what's that called, the, the proof of personhood protocol, that's WorldCoin and uh, proof of humanity. So the information they gather, for example, like WorldCoin is uh, they gather by op. So they have to find a way to prove that the information they gather off chain is indeed been deployed on chain correctly. So that's where the ZK proof is going to kick in. But um, it's still not clear how exactly they're going to implement it or whether what is their current progress, to be honest. Interesting. Well, one one to uh, to watch going forward. Tammy, thank you so, so much. Uh, and glad you got to uh, check out Paris and, and ECC. And thank you to everyone else for dialing in. That's a wrap for this week. Um, enjoy the, the rest of the week and we will see you next week. Take care.